I want you to turn with me this morning, and we're going to look, is the kingdom our priority? Is it really? Is it, is it the priority that we have uh, in our lives? And uh, we looked at it last week. I'm not going to go back there again. I, I just can't uh, uh, recover what I've already covered, but I am going to touch on it and whatever. And uh, I'm not going to get past the, the, the next slide I'm giving you, but uh, I'll do that. I'm going to read it to you uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gets in the middle of the sermon and he's done explaining to him the blessed are you and all that and got into the middle. And then the, I think the middle holds the key point. And the key point is 633, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you, okay? So verse 19, <clears throat> Jesus is speaking and says, do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up, your, uh, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. I told you last week, Jesus did not leave the subject. Same subject. He's telling you, what are you focused on? Whatever you're focused on, you'll seek. And most of the world he talks about, he's been talking about in these verses, and, and most of the world, it's still in our world today, they're seeking after money. To be success, people want to know how much money you have. To be a success, they want to know how much fame you have. To be a success, they want to know how much education you have. But Jesus says to be a success, you need to know where you are in the kingdom. I'm getting preaching for him preaching. I, could have, I started to read it this morning, I, but I don't want to take time for all of that. Uh, one of the things that I learned, and probably some of you have learned the same thing, studying psychology in college, uh, Maslow's uh, nine laws uh, uh, of need for every human being and go through there and it starts out with shelter and food and all this and security and all that down there. And number nine is, is uh, significance. It's interesting that in America, we're a people of, uh, uh, we, we have most of us, most all Americans have food, clothing and shelter. And so we kind of forget those things. They, they really don't matter anymore. But really where the rubber meets the road is significance. And people think, don't think I'm significant because I've lost my money. I lost my job. I lost my family. I lost, I lost, I lost. And all of those things are above on the need level that you've lost. But hear this right now. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you never lose your significance. Because your significance is your identity with the king and not your reality of what you have or you think you have in the world. Listen to me. There's nothing you're going to take with you except what you already sent ahead of you. Put it in the box. It ain't going in the box because the box ain't going nowhere. Wherever you add is where you're going. And what's most important, you'll find out, really, you never really find that out till you're on your deathbed and you really realize what is the most important thing in life. And that's not just for dying. That's for living. Listen, you can't live unless you know the most important person, and that's Jesus. Let me get back to where I'm at. What are you watching? What are you looking at? What's your eye on? But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can... Now listen to what he said. All this still goes together. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devo be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's talk about that in a minute. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. All of those are on Maslow's laws of need, okay? Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? 
who of you by worrying? Worry's wrong. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans, pagans are not people who, who are atheists. Pagans are people who don't know the true God. That's, there's a lot of religious people in here, uh, in here in the world that do not know God. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble for its own. Now I'm going to Luke. Just read a few pats, three uh, or four, uh, ver about four verses there. And it's the same message, but I'm just taking a portion out of it. Reads a little different, okay? For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Jesus has this in Matthew that He doesn't ask their word. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. And give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that, you will, that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father, we thank you for your word. It never comes back, but what accomplishes what you sent out to do. We receive that today. Let us be mindful of what our priority is. And it is, is it the kingdom of God? Lord, thank you for enlightening us. Lord, this is not a message for somebody else. It's a message for me. This is not a message for your neighbor. It's a message for you. And Father, release that to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week. These two slides were last week, so I'm not going to deal with them. I'm just going to uh, hit them and go on. All of us have been created to have dominion. When God created mankind, uh, God's purpose for mankind in Genesis chapter 1, 26, uh, uh, 1, 26 and tw through 28, his purpose for mankind was to have dominion. That means we have something inside of us that wants to have dominion over our circumstances, over our life, and even over our death. Think about this just a minute. Adam didn't have to worry about when he was going to die, when he was in the garden, because there wasn't no death. I believe that's coming back to the kingdom of God. And we're not going to be about worried about death because God's going to give life. There's somebody, some of us, that's going to be changed in coming or whatever, but we will all be changed. I believe there's a day coming. The Bible says the last enemy of God is death. There's a day coming where there's going to be a people who's going to stand up and say, that's enough of this. Ain't going to do this no more. That's it. And Jesus said, I've been looking for that. I'm coming back. I'm ready. Okay? I believe that's the way. See, we're always waiting on God to do something. God's done all that God's going to do. Waiting for you to do something. Really, what he's waiting on is for you to believe something. Not just in your head, but in your heart. Okay? And dominion is what Adam had. God said to Adam, Adam, everything that you have in your relationship with me right here, I want you to take it out there and make the world just like it is right here. Do you get it? There's a lot of people who think all there is is the church. Jesus didn't preach the church. Jesus preached the kingdom. And the kingdom is everywhere. And God says, I want you to take what you got right here in these four walls, and I want you to take what's in your life and I want you to take it out there and make that like this. And if it ain't good here, then it ain't going to be good there. And that's why God says, I want you to do something here to make it good here, to make it good out there. See, the kingdom of God ought to be changing your finances, your health, and your marriage, and your family. I want the kingdom to come. 
I, I, now I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting, whatever. Let me, let me just go ahead and calm down, Rick. Help me a little bit, Lord. You know, I don't just preach this stuff. I want to live this stuff. And the thing is, God will make me live up to what I preach. He will. Listen, I, people say, well, he's just telling us. No, I'm not telling you because uh, believe me, whatever I tell you, I have to go home and live it out. And can I tell you something? It works. Well, you ain't perfect. No, I'm not. But can I tell you, I praise God just like what we saw with Ray over here. I praise God for my family. And can I tell you something? They're living examples that this stuff works. I mean this. My, my grandson right now, his, uh, he loves trucks and cars, but especially trucks. And his favorite, two favorite things are the school bus, because he sees it every day when his sister gets on the school bus, and a garbage truck. He is fascinated by garbage trucks. Listen to me. I don't care if he drives a garbage truck. He's the garbage man as long as he's a kingdom man. Are you listening to me? Seek first the kingdom of God. You know, it doesn't matter what your job is. It matters where you're seeking. And if you're seeking just a job, you've missed it. But if you're seeking the kingdom, it don't matter what job you got, you're still going to get it. Jesus was the first and only man who had full dominion over the conditions and circumstances in his life. In his life. And he was, oh, he was an overcomer. Revelation 3, 21, seven times he says to the seven churches, be overcomers. To be an overcomer, you've got to go through something. Out of your mess comes your message. Out of your mess comes your message. It's not the great times that we go through, but it's the valleys that we go through that proves who we really are. Anybody can praise God as long as you got money and bank and everything's going well with everything else. But there are things that are coming in your life that you will have to overcome. You are not a victim, you're a victor. Get out of the victim mentality. The first time we see him in his childhood, Jesus, that is, the first time we see him in his childhood, he's telling his parents, we must, he must be about his father's business. Luke 2, 4, uh, 4, 46 through 50. Listen to me. I'm doing my daddy's work, and so are you. Because you, we're called into the same kingdom and we're called with the same priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. We have been invited to join the family business, the kingdom of God. This is family business. We belong to the family. We're in the business, okay? Why people don't make the kingdom their priority? Why, why don't people, did I miss one? Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, why don't people, if the kingdom is what Jesus preached, and it was the most important. Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus came and proclaimed himself king. He was the king. He not only was the king, but he demonstrated the kingdom and he proclaimed the kingdom. Jesus' message was never the message church. His message was the kingdom. And the kingdom is God's domain. The kingdom is God's dominion. The kingdom is God's rule. God is ruling over this earth. Listen. I know I'm controversial, but I am biblical. Listen to me. Jesus never preached evacuation. He preached transformation. We are here not to evacuate. We are here to transform. Exactly. Can I say that? I like that. We're here not to, hey, we're not here to give in. We're here to take over. That's why we're here. That's what God's called us to do. And he's given us the ability to do that. And we've got to come into the realization of what God's called us to. You ain't on the Titanic. And we ain't trying to get to uh, lifeboats to save a few people. We've been called to save the world. Listen to me, uh, some of you have been to Noah. I, I believe that Noah made a big enough boat for everybody to get on. 
They just wouldn't. The kingdom of God is big enough for everybody. God didn't want to leave anybody out, but you still got to make choices. Why people don't make the kingdom their priority? Why don't they? If, if this is the priority of God, this is the priority of Jesus, why don't king, people make the kingdom? First of all, they don't understand what's being offered to them. They just don't see it or they don't get it. I know why pe most people don't want to come to the kingdom, why they don't fill these seats up and whatever. They don't understand what's being offered to them. See, most of the time what we offer to people is religion. And who wants miserable religion? Do this, don't do that, or you're going to hell. That's religion, and that's miserable, and nobody is going to be one like that. Jesus, everybody wanted, hey, if, if you notice something, the religious people didn't want what Jesus had, but the people in the world wanted what Jesus had. The people of the world saw the value of what Jesus was preaching because they understood that the kingdom he was offering with, to them was not some by and by day you're going to go to heaven, but I'm going to give you something right now because I am the king and I'm demonstrating preaching the kingdom to you. Yeah, I can see some of them. The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, whoever you want to name, all those people that uh, religious people call sinners, and they got it. They got it. And the religious people standing over there and say, oh, they don't, they, they're not this and they're not that. Jesus wasn't telling them what they were or were not. He was telling them what he was offering them. Listen, the offer's good. Just don't understand the offer. Can I tell you something? Somebody died and left you an inheritance. But the only way you're going to get it is to study it and to know it and to walk in it. What was my inheritance? L listen, don't want to shock you. Oh, my inheritance is a million dollars. My inheritance is a billion dollars. My uh, inheritance is a trillion dollars. Can I tell you it's bigger than that? Your inheritance is God. That's what the Word says. He says... Tell the priest they're not going to get anything. Sell what you got. Don't give it away. Because what? Your inheritance is, uh, is my, my inheritance. And you are my inheritance. God says you're my inheritance. Can, can I give you some scripture? Go with that. I, I, this is not an outline, but just let me give you the scripture that go along with it. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 and 6, I'm not going to read that. I was going to read it, but I'm not. I'm not going to read that. I just want you to listen to it. Jesus had, in, in Revelation chapter 4, and verses 4 through 6, it says you've been bought. You don't belong to you. You've been bought with a price by the precious blood of the Lamb. That's what it says. And He has made you. He's not going to make you. He's made you kings and priests. A king has all the resources. And a king has all the authority. He said, I've made you kings, and then I've made you priests. A priest is one who speaks the word of God. We've got to realize that God gave us a message to put in our mouth, and the message is the message of Christ Jesus. It is the message of the gospel. It is the message of the kingdom of God. You don't know what you got. Find out what you got. I had a story in, in, in uh, a long time ago. I had a missionary come here, and I just thought it was tremendous. And, uh, and uh, he, he came and, and uh, spoke, and he said, you know what? Uh, a missionary went to a foreign land, and he won this little boy, and he saw him out there in the woods, and he didn't have any place to stay or anything to eat and whatever, and he brought him in his house, and he, and he put clothes on him and uh, put him by the uh, the, the fire and he gave him something to eat and, uh, and, and put him to bed at night and give him a safe place to live. So folks came to the kid who'd been an orphan, didn't know anything, came to the kid and said, do you know what the love of God is all about? He said, the man that took me in told me about the love of God. 
I don't know what the love of God is, but I know this. It warms a little boy's body. Gives a little boy something to eat. Puts a little boy in bed at night. The little boy don't have to have anything to worry about anymore. That's the love of God. That's a demonstration of the kingdom of God. God has given us provision. And that provision works. When we believe in the king, we get the king's provision. But we have to speak forth the resources. Why? Because we're the priest of God. Stop telling like it looks like and tell it like God says it is. We're not here to proclaim the world. We're here to proclaim him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23 said, I pray, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that you might know the hope to which you've been called, the inheritance in all the saints. See, my inheritance is not only God. My inheritance is you. I'll just sit there for a while. It'll soak in in a minute. Listen to me. I've never heard, there may have been a miracle like that, I've never heard where that, that God has rained down dollar bills from heaven. Now, Lord, you can start that here. I appreciate it. That'd be great in that whole deal. But God has deposited dollar bills in every one of his vessels. Listen, if the kingdom of God is yours, then when God gets to you and says, I need my deposit, you'll give me your deposit. Listen to me. What you give away to God, don't say is a loss, it's a gain. Because everything you give to God is seed that he gives back to you. It comes back in a thousand different ways. Maybe money, maybe health, maybe whatever. But I want to tell you, God is no Indian giver, and whatever that you give away, he will always get back. But we've got to be God's people decreeing the kingdom of God. Not talking like the world has. The world always looks at what we need and what we don't have. But God always reminds us of who he is and what we do have. That's important. Jesus said to, to Peter, when you're the Christ, he became, listen to me, you came into the kingdom when you received the king. I'm not waiting on a kingdom that's coming. I've already received the kingdom and am receiving the kingdom and is coming. Why? Because I've accepted the king. Jesus told a religious guy. You remember the religious guy, Nick, came to him by night, Nicodemus? He said, Nicodemus, verse 3. You can't even, you, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you are born from above. Nicodemus, in, in two verses down, Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless, what, you're born from above. When you were born from above, you got the ability to see the kingdom and you, what, entered the kingdom of God. Now, I want to stop there just a minute and tell you something. You've only come through the entrance at what? Salvation. There's more to this. It's not your getting more. When you enter the kingdom, you start having knowledge of the king that shows you what you already have and you can appropriate. I was reading the other night, uh, what kind of appropriations you doing? If you went before a judge or you went before whatever and you wanted something, you'd be working at it, Whatever. But you don't realize that we in the kingdom of God have not come before earthly judges or kings. We have become before the heavenly throne, and the heavens have everything. Not just a few things, they got everything. But we got to appropriate that. How do you do that? I was reading the other night, I liked it, I'm reading the Psalms again. In Psalms 149, it talks about, all the Psalms are about praise. And it goes down in verse 6 and it says, God's high and holy praises should fill your mouths. For their shouted praises are your weapons of war. These warring weapons will bring vengeance. And every opposing force and every resistant power 
to bind kings and chains and rulers with irons of shackle. Praise, feel warriors will enforce the judgment doom decreed against the enemies of God. This is the glorious honor he gives to all his godly lovers. Hallelujah, praise God. Jesus says it this way in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom of God. And whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. How do we bind and loose? By putting praises in your mouth and doing warfare with God. Praises said, it's not going to be done, it's already done. We're praising God because he's already given us the victory in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Listen to me. Those little phrases don't come off of cereal boxes or out of books that you've gotten and they nice little phrases that we make over they come out of our heart from the word of God see Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 faith comes by hearing hearing what? the message it says one translation says hearing the message the message of Christ Faith comes by hearing the message of Christ. And faith is where? In your heart and in your mouth. Listen to me. You got to get it to your heart before it comes out of your mouth and makes a difference. See, we are the people of God prophesying the kingdom of God. We're prophesying what God says, not what we say. I know y'all don't do that. I have problems with it sometimes. So you can hear the confessions of your preacher. I get mad. And I start telling God what I think he needs to know. Now, you don't ever do that, do you? I did this, week, this last week. I say I do this, and I, I, do, I don't... I honestly don't give names. I've thought about it, but I don't give names because he really doesn't listen to that to me. And God lets me get through what I'm saying. I said, God, I just don't understand this. I need Ray Kiker, and I need him well. Now, if you want a list of people to take to heaven, I can give you a list. I was not happy. But can I tell you something? God is very gentle with us and lets us get through with our ranting and raving. And after we get through, he says, yeah, but I got something I want to say. Listen to me. God's wisdom is in your mouth. You just don't realize it. And God is not giving you a famous scripture we quote, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll just move back and forward and I'll get it. Uh, Psalms 37, we like to quote this one. Psalms 37, verse 4. Uh, but we only do the last part of the verse. And here's what we do. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, I'm going out here and get the desire. I'm going to get me a new Bentley. I'm going to get me a fur coat. I'm going to get this and that, whatever. I, I had a, a famous, I'm not going to call it, the famous uh, uh, ministry talking about that. They want, they want a fur coat. and what? I'm not going there. That's between them and God, okay? I believe God had something a little higher in mind. Because he just said, if you remember what I read, it, here's prosperity. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll add the other stuff. I'll throw it in for nothing. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to believe for it. God says, I'll just throw it in. Boy, you done got quiet on me. We don't like that part. Well, let me give you the first part of Psalms 37, verse 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good, and dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know why? Because when you, when you delight yourself in the Lord, you want what he wants. You start asking for what he's asking for. You start doing what he's doing. Instead of your little plan that you've placed in, in, in motion, you start wanting God's plan. It becomes a driving force and desire in you that I want to see the kingdom of God come on this earth. 
I want to see the kingdom of God flow out of my life. God has promised this to me, and God has given this to me, and we've got to come forth out of our hearts and out of our mouth. Listen to me. I'm winding. The devil has words. The devil, the devil is a copycat. He's not an originator. He's a copycat. People say, listen to me. Are you saying your theology says God can't do what he's going to do, so he's got to bust all of us out here because we've got to get out of here before the Antichrist over, overtakes us? Uh, listen to me. I don't think that's good theology. I just don't. Hear this. In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says that he is so outraged at God's people that he sends a flood out of his mouth. Have you been hearing a flood lately? But you know what it says about the devil's words? Here, here's what it says about the devil's word in Revelation chapter 12. But that's okay because God the Christ takes care of the woman and puts her in a safe place and the earth swallows up this wor the devil's words. Have you noticed all the yay yeah, yeah? And notice what comes out of it. Before long, they even forget what they nag that yay yeah, yeah about. You know why? Because the earth chews it up, swallows it up. But hear this. God says of his word, know this, my word is like the rain in the snow. It comes down and then it goes back up. My word that goes out of my mouth, not your, my mouth, what will never return to me void but will accomplish all that I've sent it out to do. Can I tell you, God does not have words that do not come true. Don't happen. God says, I am there to make sure that my words come to pass. But God's people have got to realize that they've got to speak God's words, not your words. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God said. And we've got to spend time with God to know what God said so we can speak the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I want to tell you, Miss uh, Tina's going to have a meeting this afternoon. I remind them all the time, and I'll remind them again this afternoon. Prophet, it's a prophet's meeting. Prophets, I'm going to remind you of something. Speak the word of the Lord. Not the word of your favorite prophet. Not the word of your favorite preacher. Not the word of the favorite government official you have. What is the word of the Lord? People are tired of words. They want to hear the word, the word of God. We're after Father's business. Let me just see if I can wind this down. Let me, let me do this. I, I'm going to give you this. And I, I, I'm covering these two points. I'm not covering them very well, but all the points is in there, okay? They don't understand what's being given to them. The second thing, they don't know the value. If you really understood what's really been given to you, you'd want to seek the kingdom every time you wake up. The second thing is, if you understood the value, it would change your life. Change your life how? First of all, you would have a different perspective on money, on what true happiness is, and what success is. You'd have a whole mindset change. Whole mindset change. See, God doesn't see, view success as like we see, view success. It really doesn't. God's success is the purpose of God being fulfilled. I feel bad sometimes because I come to God and ask him, I said, Lord, I just don't believe anybody's listening to me. I'm being honest. I ain't listening. And I want to take out my little hammer and knock a little head, hole in your head and pour it into you so you get it better. But that don't work. And I hold it. But hear this. Noah, I ain't Noah yet. Noah preached a hundred years and only saved his family. But God says, Noah, that's just right. I'll make a whole new world out of them. That was a success. I would have looked at it as a failure, but God looks at it as a success. See, God never looks at numbers. He looks at fulfillment of his word.
Now, this, this is one, and I promise this is it. Hear this right now. Has God changed our mentality? In our lives, have our mentality changed? I want to ask you something. If he bought us, that means he bought everything about us and everything we own. I want to get to that mentality. God says, sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and just come follow me. Hmm. i got to hold on to some of this stuff. I might need it. That's our mentality. But I'm going to tell you something. When you really find out what God's got, it changes your whole perspective. Luke chapter 15, this is part, but I want you to get this. In Luke chapter 15, well, there's really two times in there. One time Jesus talks about two, he gives two parables of two sons. And one time he gives a parable of uh, two sons and he says, and he's talking to Israel, who he's talking to, Israel, my son, and Jesus, my son. And, and anyway, the, the whole deal. And he goes to his son and said, would you do this and whatever? And oh, yeah, I'll do that. That's Israel. But she didn't, they didn't do it. Other son, I said, I won't, but he went and fulfilled it. And God says, which is the obedient son? The one who was obedient and did what his master said. You know, we got a good way of doing a lot of mouthing, but how much living will we do it? Second parable, two sons, is found in Luke chapter 15. We ought to know that thing pretty well by now. In Luke 15, it's the son who said, I wanted what's mine. And the son who stayed home and served the father out of duty. But I want you to get this. I hope I'm not being too coarse, but I want you to get it. Okay? You have two perspectives, if you will, worldly perspectives in those two sons. One son was a horror. He spent his money on whores. Translate that. He spent his money on his pleasure. Okay? Let me say it again. He spent his money on his pleasure. The other son was a hoarder. And he saved his money for himself. Daddy looked at second son, the religious son. He said, son said, you never, you never took a lamb and you never gave it to me. And the father said, all I have belongs to you. You could say it this way, you hoarding thing. You could have gone out to the best flock in the, ever there and had any best one you wanted and had all your friends over and something. He didn't like the party. You know why? Because he didn't want his friends getting his stuff. Are you listening to me? You have two world perspectives. I'm going to spend all mine for my pleasure. I'm going to do all this for me and my pleasure. Me, 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 my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. And you have other folks that, look at them folks. They just waste everything, and I'm hoarding it up. You know, that's what we do when we hear Sunday after Sunday messages, and we don't ever share it with the world. We're hoarding it up. For ourselves when the world is starving to hear what he says those are the two perspectives of the world can I give you the perspective of the father the perspective of the father is giving notice something he gave a lamb he gave a feast he gave the music and then he went in and gave the son who had wasted everything on pleasure, went back and gave it to him, his rope, his ring, and his shoes. Do you think he'd just come in to throw, that's what the religious person thought, he'd just come in and throw his money away. That wasn't it. See, Father is interested in teaching us his heart. And Father's heart is to give. It, it's not what you have. It's what you give away. And, and when I say that, I'm not just talking about money. I am talking, listen to me, I am talking about money. But I ain't talking about just money. You know why he could be a free giver? 
Because Jesus said it this way for that prodigal son and for us, freely you have received, freely give. It's given to you. Paul says, what do you have that wasn't given to you? It's all given to you. So why is it so hard for you to give it away? Our mentality is, is we got the hoarding mentality, and we want to hold on to it because we don't think there is any more. Heaven ain't never run out. And if heaven runs out, they got the God, the Creator, and they'll just make some more. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. See, religion is always working, try to make myself right so I can please God. But his righteousness ends all of that and says he's the one that's right and he made me right. I'm not seeking my righteousness, that's religion, but I'm seeking his righteousness. But when I, when I really realize, when that kingdom is birthed inside of me, I realize that the kingdom of God does not come with careful observation, but the kingdom of God is within you. Just take what you got and give it away. Now, let me close with this. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. I need to read that. Did I write it down? Did I put that down? I think I did. No, I didn't. I didn't write that down. 410. But anyway, it's okay. I can give it to you, the gist of it anyway. In 1 Peter 410, it says, to use the gift of God that's inside you, to use the grace gift that, of God inside you to serve others, administering God's grace in all of its various forms. Every one of us have been given special things. Special things. Now, it's not saying that God can't use us in many different ways, but I'm talking about each one of us has special things. Do you know... And I've been studying that some of the, uh, they call them the, the generals of revival or whatever in the last uh, few decades and whatever, and the healing revivals and all that. Do you know most of the healing people that had tremendous giftings in the area of healing were not good speakers? They weren't good in theology. They weren't good in helping people. They were good at healing. Matthew 25 talks about the talents that have been given. Listen, every one of us, when we entered in the kingdom of God, got kingdom provision. And you've got talents and gifts inside you to give away. Freely you've received, freely give. I just wonder, people say, well, when, when, when are we going to see all these miraculous miracles and all this stuff and whatever? I think we'll see it when people come to the knowledge of what they really got inside them that God's already made a deposit in them. And when you do, you're going to start seeing it everywhere. It's a tipping point. But hear this. It's not my job. We won't, we won't be like Peter looking at John. Well, what about him? Jesus said, that's not none of your business. You follow me. My job is to discover the giftings that God's placed inside of me and to give it away to everybody. My job is to take those things that God has given me and make sure I'm a giver and give away to everyone. I want to be a giver in life because givers in life are only planting seeds of the kingdom of God that they're going to harvest in this world and also in the world to come. Listen to me. It's double dividend day. You not only get credit here, you get credit there. Can I tell you something? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Stand to your feet or I won't quit. In Genesis chapter 45, I like this part. Genesis 45. Joseph is finally uh, presented to his brothers, and they go back to their father and... and uh, but that they've taken the best from Egypt and gone back and, and Joseph gives them this message this message from Pharaoh and Pharaoh is a representative of God and, and the son goes back and he tells them this and here's what he says I sent the carts for you 
They ain't enough for your stuff. Throw your stuff away. Because all the best of Egypt belongs to me. And I'm going to give it to you. Listen to me. If we really got a handle on this, giving wouldn't be a problem to us. Now, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm talking about our talents, our abilities, whatever. Oh, well, I don't have nothing. I don't have but one. I don't care what you got. If you know how to twang one little string, string, listen to me, twang the string. And can I tell you, God says he'd been faithful to do that. I'll give him some more. God is looking for people. I said we're going to close out with this, and I am. 